Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for, to, for Steffi to having me again to meet some of the most interesting people around, like you, and we talked yesterday, and um, I'm very thrilled to talk to you because you stand for one side of a really, really crucial debate where I didn't make my mind up yet fully. Well, let's see how far we get, Henry. <laughs> let's see how we get. So, I mean, you've been championing You've been championing uh, open source for a long, long time. Yeah, and, most uh, of my career. Uh, and now you fight for a thing called trustworthy AI, which has become another big idea. Um, and following the current debates, they seem to be contradictory, if you really take the current st st state of the AI debate. Um, convince me otherwise. Well, maybe we'll go back to the current state of it in a minute, but I, I think first some definitions. I mean, right. for, for us, we've been working on trustworthy AI for about five years, and it's really two simple things for us. Agency and accountability, and maybe agency is a bit like right. so sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So agency meaning at an individual level, I can shape what the AI d does, I can understand it. Accountability, you can see what happened, and if something went wrong, you know, you know who you can kind of go at. And open source, at its core principles, is actually really good at both of those things. Right. So if you take accountability first for a second, think about open source in the past. You know, we went into the internet era incredibly worried, and we're still incredibly worried about cybersecurity. Like this, you know, we can take advantage of people's computers, we can hack right. into them, we can cause all kinds of havoc. Open source has been central, and Mozilla has played a role in getting, you know, hundreds of thousands, in many cases millions of people around the world looking at security problems so we find them faster and can fix them. And we uh, invented or kind of helped pioneer the idea of the bug bounty. So people can say, hey, I found a security hole, fix it. And I, I think when we look at moving into auditing AI, seeing what's wrong, why did some of the things that Jonas was showing, like why did ChatGPT say that there was a, you could fit this many leaders in the whatever, uh, or why did this misinformation happen, or why did this harm happen? Open source, transparency, community, which are core tenants, actually wielded well, wielded with discipline, wielded in a regulatory setting, is actually lending itself to that, it's set up for that. Right. And I would say the same on the sovereignty and agency side. But how far did we get to the black box era in AI? Is this technically still possible? I mean, like, I, me as a layman, I come from the humanities, for journalism, for me, open source is, is, very, is something very understandable if you, if you go into security problems uh, where you can look at code, and, um, but isn't AI now at a point where people don't understand it anymore, what happens inside these, it's kind of like a big thing of dough and then they make a piece of bread out of it, but <laughs> you don't really know how that happens. Or an oven or something, right. but you don't know, the bread just comes out. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what Jonas and you know, the whole industry, including uh -huh. OpenAI, are working on, right, is how do we understand what happened in the black box? And we talk about auditing, explainability, like, we can't move forward with this stuff without solving that. We can't. And do we want to only solve by a few companies behind closed doors? Or do we want to solve it collectively where as we learn how to see, we can all see. As we learn how to see, many different people can try to solve the problem. Because th that black box problem is a problem whether it's open or closed. But is that, can we still open it? I mean, yeah. it was, so like, take Facebook, which is kind of a, whatever, brute, crude, early form of AI type of algorithm machine. And it seems, if you look at the f Facebook files, that they don't really understand anymore how their machine works. And that's still clear code and algorithms and very, very obvious. And so how can we get to still understand generative AI? Well, uh, as I say, I think that's, uh, the, that's the state of the art is, uh -huh actually building the technology that can look back into and crack the code. Right. So we take the simple example of, of Facebook, or in our case, YouTube. Uh, you know, YouTube also couldn't explain why was it sending people down rabbit holes, the same kind of stuff. Right. And we crowdsource with 50,000 people, sounds kind of small, but 50,000 people donating their browser history so we could watch what was YouTube doing. And that kind of external, I mean, basically what's called red teaming and security, you can use to start understanding what's going on. And so it's a big part of what we need to develop is these tools that allow us to look inside those black boxes and then build them so that they can actually be interrogated. Right. So the big players, OpenAI, they have 
supposedly open source in their company brand name. Yeah, kind of on. But we know. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> so um, called so open AI. How how is the open source question? I mean, what if you bring it to the table with the big players in Silicon Valley? Because it seems all very closed source right now. Well, I mean, I, and I think actually. Even worse, there's a lot of doom and gloom starting to come from some of them, right? I mean, right. Mustafa Suleiman, who uh, you know founded DeepMind, which was owned by Google, even Sam Altman are really questioning open source. And you got to ask, you know, well, first of all, I think you got to be skeptical. Why? Why are they saying the sky is falling and open source is going to make it fall faster and harder? And you got to look at their motivations. You got to look at the risks that they're saying. Like, why is the, are they saying the sky is going to fall? And also, if they think it's going to fall so fast, why they put this stuff out there in the first place? So I think we we actually have a thing that is really from the playbook of Microsoft in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> there was this thing called FUD. Do you remember FUD? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right. It was their marketing right. technique to make sure that Linux or anything like that wouldn't compete with them. Right. right. Linux is communism. Linux is insecure. How can you trust it? And I think what's actually happening now is these folks have gathered a bunch of turf and they're building a moat. And one of the things they're afraid of, I mean, there's a, a famously recently leaked Google memo, memo about this, is that open source means they don't have a moat. Okay. But, I mean, Sam Altman was here in Munich. He was on a, on a world tour and it, he, he managed to portray it as if he does the right thing, asking all the state leaders here in, 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 in Europe to be regulated, to like invite them for regulation and uh, warning them of inherent dangers. And I mean, he even suggested the establishment of something like the, the International Atomic Energy Agency for AI. And now last week, DeepMind co-founder Mustafa Suleiman, he even went a step further and he's, he basically asked for AI to be licensed. So you can only work on AI if it's licensed. Don't they do the right thing? I mean, all you know, the like, past 15 years, nobody wanted to be regulated, and there was surprise, some surprise, surprise. <laughs> right. Well, I think that partly gets back to this moat idea. So you have to ask about what are their motivations. But on the same, you know, at, at the same time, of course, there are risks. I mean, people like us, people like Tim Gebru, people like the the European Commission, the European oh. Parliament have been asking and talking about AI risk for a while now. And so it's, I think at this point, uh, I want to separate out that idea of sort of the sky is falling, please regulate us, which seems pretty disingenuous to me. You don't have Sam Altman coming and saying, please implement the AI Act. You have him saying, this is a disaster, please let us tell you how to regulate. Right. But I think also to pull that apart from the, what are the actual dangers. And one danger certainly is catastrophe, right? AI is used by terrorists. AI destroys our democracies, although both of those things have already been done by existing social media platforms. Mm -hmm. The other is a dystopian kind of tech, you know, overlords can running things, right? A few companies are, are running the world, they set the rules, which is kind of leaning in that direction. And for me, we actually need to slow down. We need to slow down enough at least to ask, how do we look at those two problems together and piece through what does good governance look like? Where does something like open source pitch in? How do we actually you know, control this stuff in a way that is about humanity going in the right direction? I, I think there's actually a, a bit of a false panic going on right now. Well, what do you think is a realistic list of current dangers of AI? I mean, it's a very long, well, I guess. Give it the top five. <laughs> So certainly, you know, we have a lot of elections happening in the world in the next year. And certainly that's probably the top of my top five is the misinformation we saw over the course of, let's say, Brexit or the 26th election or in the U.S. or, or elections here. We're now at a spot where synthetic media you can create like that. So, I, I mean, I do think that is a, is, is a huge risk. How, how would open source help? Well, I think you can see where something came from, right? So if what we want to be able to do is authenticity at scale. There are efforts to watermark, say, you know, AI-generated image, images. Mm -hmm. The more we're able to scrutinize, the more we're able to see what's real and what's not. Okay. So I but think isn't, that's one. Isn't it all still voluntary? I know that uh, you know, Adobe implements watermarks that if something's created with their Firefly AI that you can, like, check it. And But if you really want to do something 
something mischievous or even evil. Yeah, you're going you to gonna try it? to mask it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where I think you need both an open source community that's trying to basically red team and interrogate what's going on, right? Okay. So I mean, right. it's the voluntary piece is only going to go so far. Right. Uh, and then you need regulation. Somebody's got to be accountable. It goes back to this question of agency and accountability. And I think the, the DSA, the DMA, and, and then the AI Act, the second wave of European tech regulation, which is how I think about it, aren't perfect, mm -hmm. aren't going to protect us perfectly in that set of elections, the ones in Europe, but are headed in the right direction to say there is accountability for the big platforms where this stuff can spread. There, are, there is going to be some way to think about how we regulate foundation models. Any chance that the Section 230 is abolished anytime? Any oh, now you, you can. <laughs> by the way, not from California. I'm Canadian, so I have my Canadian. Uh, although Canada is a very big place, maybe we're expanding soon to include California. Um, uh. <laughs> and then maybe Section 230 will be abolished. Okay. I mean, it's a very tricky question. It's tricky because I think it has done a lot of good for the internet. I don't think you would have seen many of the right. things we like about the internet evolve without that, you know, the, the previous group folks were talking about that, that kind of American free speech underpinning of a lot of what happened on the internet, and it's caused an incredible amount of harm. And the, the real unfortunate thing, more unfortunate for, for other reasons than just 230, I don't think there's the political will or ability to get anything passed in Washington that mm. is going to change it. So I, I think it's there for a bit for if you're realistic. In Europe, we sometimes feel a little bit like a digital colony of America, and so we're slowly starting to change when there's great companies in Heidelberg who obviously have <laughs> potential to be a real competition, but still there's this feeling, and there's always sometimes this uh, feeling that unless things change in America, things will never really change. So how do you see the current counterbalance between the EU and the US? Because some people say, well, what the EU is doing is crucial. Yeah, I mean, uh, Canadians feel the same way, just to, you know, <laughs> to, to relate a little bit and empathize. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a real possibility that what is happening in the EU with the, the wave of tech regulation, with some of the speakers who are here, is there could be a different kind of tech industry here. One that is based on trustworthiness, the one that is kind of based on a, a set of, you know, accountability that differentiates things, actually, is a different kind of way of doing it. I think the real weakness in Europe, and, and it's true in Canada as well, and this is not new for the AI era, mm -hmm. is the capital and the fluidity of capital to scale businesses. So the idea right. that you could build defensibility on AI that's more trustworthy, that mm -hmm. to me is believable, right? That people, that certain kinds of, I mean, Jonas talked about it, W that you have companies coming in wanting to buy this stuff because they want it to be accurate. They want to know mm -hmm. if they hurt a customer. They know they're, you know. So if you could build stuff that companies rely on because it's more trustworthy, yeah. there is a market in that. I mean, the Mozilla AI, which we launched in March, it's focused on that. Mm -hmm. The question of whether the resources to scale companies and compete on that competitive an advantage, I think that's a big uh, question for places like Europe and places like Canada. Right. But, um, so now we kind of, if, we, if we, get, we, we only got to number one of the top five dangers, but we're also <laughs> kind of running out of time. Well, um, I, will, I will say one of, the other, one of the top five dangers, it's a little bit more long term, is just that we continue to lose control. And that's the agency side of what trustworthy AI mm -hmm. is for us. I mean, okay. if I were to, to kind of fantasize about the future, and you know, Tim Berners-Lee, the, the, one of the inventors of the web, talks about kind of data pods in your home, which I don't think is going to work out the way he talked about it. Right. But I think having an AI that is truly ours, that isn't under corporate control, open source is potentially a pathway to that. And having something that we trust, as we're just assaulted by other AIs, is something that I, I hope can be in the, the future. And the danger is continued loss of personal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So you're not just an advocate. You also do stuff with the Mozilla Foundation. That's how um, we advocate. So how do you approach, like how do you actively approach uh, with Mozilla AI and with the Mozilla Foundation what's at stake here? Yeah, so I mean, Mozilla, known for Firefox, but has always stood for the user, for reclaiming the internet. And we realized about two years ago, we can't just use the browser if we want to make a difference in those areas uh, in the AI era. So we started a venture fund last year, which is predominantly focused on trustworthy AI. 
So companies that are actually putting trust, privacy, human interest first, mm -hmm. and those are all people building products, whether they're social media products or AI auditing products. And then we launched Mozilla AI, a separate company under the Mozilla umbrella, um, I guess in March. Mm -hmm. And it's really about these questions of how do we align AI with our interests? And how do we use open source as the foundation of it? So as we get better at that, it actually accrues and other people can use it. And as they get better at it, it accrues and more people can so, use so it. So are you, are you building a Mozilla Foundation model or? Well, what we're actually doing is looking at how the speed of, of kind of growth of open source models means there's a lot of Lego bricks to already pick up, right. but they're not trustworthy to use. So I'll give you a small example, is we're building on Eleuther's model, which is sort of, it, you know, if you think of Llama and all these, it's kind of one of those, but it's more open source, mm -hmm. uh, for medical research. And in that case, you just can't trust it. If you think about some of the examples Jonas gave of the five liters and the three liters, and you're doing cancer research, you can't use that. Right. But they want to use open source because it's more private, because they want to have control over it. So what Mozilla AI is basically doing is building tooling that lets people go on top of the foundation models emerging in open source mm -hmm. and use them in ways they can trust. All right. And uh, do you get a lot of, I mean, do you, do you get the thrust that you think it will scale? Can well, you kind of gauge already? Because the, I mean, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, uh -huh. I think open source has a potential in the same way that Firefox and Linux and Apache. I mean, much of what has powered the Web 2 revolution was open source cracking a hole in Microsoft. Right. And I think there's a potential now, as so many people feel cut out, right. so many people feel worried about what might happen, that open source is a part, and only a part. There's regulation as a part of it. Just plain desire to compete and do different things is a part of it there's a chance we can kind of put a crack in the seven big players that have emerged right. on the west coast of America, and maybe Europe, maybe Canada, maybe countries in Africa, you know, have a chance to actually be winners in this. Right. As usual, uh, as soon as I think we started to talk, we are out of time. All right. The man with the bass clarinet is ready to fire. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's always a sign. Well, thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much for coming. And, and thank you. Uh,